Thank you for tuning in to Samantha's Respiratory World. Today we're going to be talking about auction devices and when it's appropriate to use them. And this will help you out on the TMC and your CSC exam and any other exams that you may have that's coming up. Okay, so first we're going to get acquainted with the FIO2 table that I created here. This is to help you associate your liters of flow to what FIO2 it is. So this has always been confusing at the beginning for students. So for one liter of oxygen flow, that's going to equal 24% FiO2. For then you go up to the next level, two liters of flow is equal to 28%. So it's increasing by four every single time. Okay, so just understand that and correlate those numbers with liters of flow per minute because that's going to come up on tests and quizzes and you need to be able to, to know it especially when it's asked in a clinical setting right then and there they're not going to give you time to go one liter is 24 percent and then keep adding four to that so you just need to kind of know that it's going to go up by four percent every time um, I definitely just memorize this and when you do it every single time you have a patient it becomes easier and you just it just comes a habit and it comes from memory so the more you do it with each of your patients especially if they're on nasal cannulas and things like that then you're going to know their liter of flow and be able to calculate their FiO2 percent so just practice with it and just get to know them and correlate those numbers with the percentage and this will help you out on your clinical test and also your CSE and your TMC test as well. So I broke these down into three categories. This is the first category which is a low flow device. These are devices that you're going to see majority of the time on tests on your TMC and your CSC selections and so there's going to be key words that I'm going to be giving you during each device whenever I noticed it in a scenario and was able to pick up on it and pick a certain device because of that keyword. So I will let you know and cue you in on those so that way you're prepared when you're taking your test on what to select and why to select it. So the first things first is low flow devices. You have your nasal cannula, your transtracheal catheter, your reservoir cannula, your pendant cannula, your simple mask, your partial non-rebreathing mask, and your non-rebreathing mask as well. So the first device that we're going to be talking about is a nasal cannula. The flow ranges are a quarter of a liter per minute to six liters per minute in adults and less than two liters per minute for infants. Your FiO2 ranges are 22 to 40 percent and the advantages are it's easy to use and it's cheap when it comes to hospital supplies and the disadvantages is it can cause nasal dryness, nasal bleeds, mouth breathing can decrease the FiO2 and it can be easily dislodged by the patients. Your ideal patients are for stable and only need a low FiO2. So home care patients that require a long-term use of oxygen may use this device. And when you're using four liters of flow or greater, please use a bubble humidifier to help with dry nasal passages. And this will also reduce the bleeding risk. And if the patient is even at a lower flow than four, but they're complaining, of a dryness feeling in their nasal cavity just go ahead and pop it on there it's not going to hurt the patient and it'll make them more comfortable so if that's what it takes to make the customer or your patient more comfortable then go ahead and do it but always check with your 
clinical instructor before you start assembling a bubble humidifier. So always check with them and let them know what's going on with the patient first and then let them say yes, okay, good call on that and then you'll be able to go ahead and set it up. So now we're going to talk about the transtracheal catheter. Flow ranges are quarter of a liter per minute to six liters per minute. Your FiO2 ranges are 22 to 35 percent. Your advantages is it eliminates skin and nasal irritation and increase patient exercise and mobility. Your disadvantages are the surgical complications that, it, that arise in it and the infections that could occur and mucus plugging and accidental removal. Your ideal patient is going to be a long-term low FiO2 patient who is ambulatory and could not tolerate the nasal cannula. So say that they might have had like skin breakdown or repetitive nosebleeds from the nasal cannula, then, they, then this would be an option for them. This um, needs to be cleaned routinely by instilling saline and inserting a wire a cleaning wire into the catheter and this should re re be replaced every three months to prevent kinks and cracked tubing or an obstruction from the mucus plug itself. I really haven't seen this on the testing questions other than in the school that you attend. They might ask you a few questions about it. So just know and a few things about it that we've discussed and I think you'll be just fine. And I have not actually seen this device in a clinical setting at all in my two years of doing clinicals. I've never seen this device used. So next is a reservoir cannula. The flow ranges are quarter of a liter per minute to four liters per minute. FiO2 ranges of 22 to 35 percent. Advantages is it allows for mobility and it conserves oxygen. The disadvantages are that it's unattractive to the patient and it usually needs to be replaced regularly and the breathing pattern affects the performance. The ideal patient who needs low FiO2 and they are ambulatory and needing to increase their mobility. How it works is that it stores approximately 20 milliliters of oxygen that the patient inhales during the early part of inspiration because the patient receives more O2 with each breath, the flow may be decreased, thus conserving oxygen. Alright, now we're going to talk about the pendant cannula. It has the exact same flow range in FiO2 as the reservoir cannula, and it works like the reservoir cannula, except that the pendant expands as the patient exhales, which forces the stored O2 in the pendant out of the pendant and up into the nasal cannula for the patient to inhale. The proper function all depends on how the patient is breathing. They need to be breathing through their nose and not through their mouth. That's the only way that it's going to activate for them to get oxygen is by breathing through their nose. The pendant can be easily hidden with clothing, so it's usually preferred over the reservoir cannula. All right, now the simple mask. The flow ranges are five to 10 liters per minute. Your FiO2 ranges are 35 to 50%. Advantages are that it's quick and easy to use and it's inexpensive. Disadvantage is it must be removed in order to eat or drink and it also can block if someone got sick and was vomiting, it could end up into an aspiration. Um, ideal patient is short-term use for those who need moderate FiO2s and that are mouth breathers. Majority of the time you will see this device on um, maybe after surgery because like I said that normally after surgery they end up breathing out of their mouth instead of their nose and that can create an issue. Um, so definitely keep this um, back of your mind as well what is the patient scenario that they're giving you this option and know that the flows have to be between 5 to 10 liters 
And the reason that is, is because anything less, it will not rinse out the CO2 and the patient could be rebreathing their own CO2 and that's not good for the patient. So we need to make sure it's at a five liters to 10 liters of flow. So that way it flushes out all that CO2 that's being retained in the mask. And I have seen this on the TMC and CSC, and that's why I'm stressing, know that the flows have to be five to 10 because they will put this as an option choice and it will say, okay, patient came out of surgery, needing oxygen, do you want a three liter nasal cannula or a three liter um, simple mask or do you want a five liters this or whatever? A lot of times you're going to see surgery and you're going to, oh, simple mask. And you're going to know that they're going to need less than five liters. So if they need less than five liters, you're not going to pick a simple mask because it requires five liters to 10 liters of oxygen in order to flush the CO2 retention out of the mask. So just remember that when you're taking tests and looking at your T TMC and your CSC, just keep that in mind, what's going on in the whole scenario. Don't let just one keyword say, aha, they need this, but the only option it gives you that device in is the flow is too low. So when you see the flow is too low, that is not going to be the proper device. So just connect the dots and read carefully through the scenarios and understand what's going on. Now we're going to get into the partial non-rebreathing mask. These next two masks that we're talking about are going to be the most confusing mask because they look so similar and they have a lot of similarities, but they're not the same. So talking about the partial non-rebreathing mask, flow ranges are 10 to 15 liters per minute. Your FiO2 ranges are 40 to 70 percent. This is the advantage of having a moderate to a high FiO2. Disadvantages, again, it blocks vomit if they become sick and the potential suffocation hazard is there. It, ideal patients are emergency short-term use for those needing a moderate to a high FiO2 and how it works is it allows the patient's first part of the exhalation of gas enter into the reservoir bag. This is gas that was left in the upper airway from the previous inspiration and is therefore high in O2, low in CO2. It's gas that did not participate in exchange at the alveolar capillary membrane. So you're going to see the bag, it needs to be completely filled before you put it on the patient. That's very important. And the next thing is looking how the patient breathes. Like if they're breathing so hard and that bag collapses all the way, then you're going to need to turn the flow up. Majority of the time I've seen these at 15 liters and then you should be fine. Um, the bag, you want it to collapse minimally, but it should not be a full collapse. So just make sure in your clinical scenarios, you read it and it says bag is partially collapsing. That's okay. You're going to want it to collapse a little bit. You just don't want it to have a full collapse. So make sure you read that part. And understand that in the different scenarios and read carefully and see what's going on. So now we're going to talk about the non-rebreathing mask. If you look closely, the partial non-rebreather and the non-rebreathing mask, they look very similar. But I'm going to tell you a secret to tell them apart. So on the non-rebreathing mask, again, flow ranges are 10 to 15 liters per minute. Your FiO2 ranges are 60 to 80 percent, so you have a very high FiO2 status, which that's an advantage. Disadvantage again is, again, it's blocking the patient. If the patient becomes sick, you're at risk at aspiration and potential for a suffocation hazard. 
ideal patient is short term for emergency uses that are needing high FiO2. Again, make sure the bag is completely filled with oxygen before applying it to the patient and make sure the bag is just partially collapsing, not all the way collapsing. If it's all the way collapsing and you only have it at 10, 12 liters per minute, then turn it up until that bag is no longer collapsing, just like partially collapsing. So now we're gonna discuss the difference between the partial non-rebreathing mask and the non-rebreathing mask. The partial non-rebreathing mask is the one that's on top and the non-rebreathing mask is the one that's on the bottom. And the easiest way to identify the difference is the non-rebreathing mask has two one-way valves on it. And you can see those valves. The first one is pointed out to that top red arrow and it is the exhalation port that the patient will exhale out of and the other valve is tucked away right there where the other arrow is pointing at it's tucked away right there on top of that bag um, that inflates and deflates slightly so those, that's the biggest giveaway right there to tell which one is which and just know that is as easy as it can be and just know the difference between those two bags and what FiO2 one gives a lower FiO2 than the other one, and the other one gives a much higher FiO2. Now our next set of devices are going to be the high flow devices, which you have the air entrainment mask, which is known by many different names that I'm going to let you know, and the high flow nasal cannula. Alright, now the entrainment mask. This is the first high flow device that we're going to be discussing, but the fancy thing about this device is it also can go down into the low FiO2 ranges. It's not just a high FiO2. Um, so don't think a high flow device is just going to be a higher FiO2. So flow ranges depends on the FiO2 that is needed. If you see the little color coded little snapping bits, okay, those little snap-ins is what your FiO2s are related to and if you look at them each one is a different FiO2 and it correlates and tells you what flow to put the flow meter at um, so that way they get the precise FiO2 that they get the advantages are that it's inexpensive easy to use and you get a preci precise FiO2 the disadvantages are you have to remove it in order for the patient to eat or drink an FiO2 greater than 40% is not always going to say a for sure FiO2 because it varies with the back pressure from the patient. The ideal patients that this is good for is those that are unstable and need a precise FiO2. So think about a patient that needs a precise FiO2 usually. Do you have the patient in mind? Okay, the patient that you would use this on is a CO2 retainer, which is our COPD patients. So if your patient has a has COPD and they are unstable and they need that precise FiO2 that is low, this is the perfect device for them. You would not want to put them on a nasal cannula if they were unstable. So when you're looking at your tests, and you know it's a COPD patient by the way it's described or you get a history with COPD think about it is the patient stable or is the patient unstable and how we know those differences between stable is and unstable is looking at their heart rate their SpO2 their respirations and also looking at a blood gas because you should be able to see a difference and also look at the picture that they're painting you for the scenario and decide do you think that patient's stable or unstable and once that choice is the is made up in your mind stable or unstable look at your choices on the devices that you have to that you get to choose from there's usually a lot of different devices that are there for you to choose on there's two that could be possibly the correct one, but that's when it comes to being very important knowing the details of the 
scenario and going from that and then you'll be able to figure it out and also just know on your COPD patients you really want to stay around 24 28 percent FiO2 um, you don't want to go much higher because you definitely don't want to blood out blunt out their respiratory drive so just keep that in mind when you're doing tests and you're reading scenarios all right, now we're going to be discussing the high flow nasal cannula. This is the last high flow device that we're going to be talking about. The flow ranges are up to 50 liters per minute, and sometimes it can be a little higher. It depends on the system that you're using. The FiO2 ranges are 35 to 90 percent. The advantages is that it's a it can it uses a wide range of FiO2s, and it also uses humidity, which can be um helpful for the patients and make it a little more comfortable. Um, disadvantages are the FiO2 depends on the system, the input flow, and the patient's breathing pattern, and there's always going to be a risk at infection. The ideal patient that this machine would be great for is a patient that has a high minute ventilation or a minute ventilation that is fluctuating and needs oxygen with some positive pressure and humidity. So this device will actually give positive pressure and will help and it kind of ventilates the patient as well. So that's very nice and I just have two different devices right here to show you that there are different device systems that you can see in the hospital. So just become familiar with this and don't be scared to ask in your clinical settings what high flow nasal cannula do you use, can we look at it, can we help set one up that's always great to do and it makes it you more com it makes you more comfortable when you're dealing with the machine and seeing what it does the last set of devices that we're going to be discussing are enclosed oxygen devices and these are devices that are seen in your NICU units and also pediatric floors um, they will be the oxy hood and the isolate which is the most common ones. So starting with the oxyhood, the flow ranges has to be greater or equal to seven liters per minute. And that helps keep the CO2 washed out of the oxyhood itself and doesn't allow the patient to rebreathe CO2. The FiO2 ranges are from 21 to 100 percent. The advantages of using the oxyhood is it has a full range of FiO2. The disadvantages is it's difficult to clean and disinfect, and the ideal patient, of course, is an infant that needs oxygen. Now to our last device, the isolate. The flow ranges for the isolate are 8 to 15 liters per minute, and the FiO2 ranges are 40 to 50 percent. The advantages is it provides temperature control. The disadvantage is that it's expensive, you, your FiO2 is unstable due to leaks that can occur, it's difficult to clean and disinfect, it's also a fire hazard and there's limits and it limits the patient's mobility range within the isolate. The ideal patient are going to be your infants who need oxygen with a precise thermal regulation which is mostly seen in your newborn babies or your premature babies. All right, and that's it, guys. Um, thank you for tuning in and watching the videos and subscribing. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope this was very helpful for you.